Okay, <clears throat> so good morning everybody, for the last time, at least in this semester, because today will be the last uh, class that we will be together. Um, I just want to remind you um, very briefly uh, of the next uh, exam date, where will be, you, know, you, know, you already know very well, on the 23rd of June. Okay? This means that uh, by the end of this week, by the 3rd of June, which is going to be next Friday, if I'm not wrong, uh, we are going to publish uh, the text uh, of the assignment for this uh, first uh, uh, date. Um, we are going to publish it uh, as a, a Google document where you can read and comment on the document. So whenever you have some questions, some, something which is not clear or uh, any other issue with the text uh, so you want, that you want to clarify, you are uh, strongly invited okay, to add some comment to the document so that we, can, we may let it open for some days and then make, publish a new revision with, with the clarification, with the, all the information that was uh, uh, you know, missing by mistake or was not written in so, uh, such a clear way. Okay? Um, we are going, we decided to have, a, since the exam will be the same in the three courses, the text will be the same, uh, at least for the two courses in English, uh, the Google document will be uh, the same. So, okay, we share it with your colleagues so that it's easier also to see other people's comments and so on. Okay, so wait for, for it uh, by, the, by the end of the week. And at the same time, uh, we are going also to, uh, to create a, a channel on, on the Slack group uh, for further discussion uh, about the exam, about the deadlines, about the publication of the scores, uh, about the schedule of the oral discussions, uh, and any other thing that may happen after the, the publication of the text. So basically, comments and the improvement of the text will happen on the Google Doc and all the other communications after the text is finalized uh, will happen on, on Slack. So remember that to enroll in the exam, you must do three things. Okay? First, uh, enroll in the exam itself, officially. And that's why we will not be able to evaluate you and uh, to record your score. Second, uh, to accept the assignment on GitHub, of course, for getting the project and the repository, the same procedure that we did during the, 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 um, uh, the big labs. The only difference that it will be individual repositories instead of uh, group repositories. And uh, a third, enroll in the Slack channel, okay, that well, I'm going to um, to publish the link uh, so that all the discussion will be there. We don't, uh, you know, pollute all, 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 the, um, all the general channel with the information related just uh, to the exam itself. Okay, so that was for the next steps. For today, we are going to spend some time in fighting again against one of the most uh, hateful aspects uh, of uh, web applications, uh, which is uh, a minimum, at least uh, giving a minimum level of authentication. So we are not talking about securing the application that would be a completely different and much more complex job. Uh, but for now, you may have noticed that uh, our application di didn't have any login, didn't have any username. They were, in a way, ass we were assuming that we had only one user, okay, uh, working on the application. And only the data about a single user and so on. And that sort of defeats the purpose of having a web application in the first place. Um, today, we are trying to see one possible way out of 10,000 different possibilities uh, to give uh, a minimum of authentication and authorization to our uh, applications. Um, and it's, it's a topic that I particularly hate because uh, it's a, it has a lot of details and corner cases uh, and uh, something I, I don't like to do very, very much, but uh, we are forced to do, a, to give you a recipe, okay? A set of steps to follow and uh, we, and there are really many steps in this, uh, and we don't have the possibility or the time to understand uh, in depth each of the steps. Hmm? So basically, uh, what we are doing is try to understand the concepts uh, and in parallel have a look at, uh, at a project that already implements all the details. Okay? I didn't want to write a code in real time here because there are so many little details uh, 
that uh, in real time is very difficult uh, to maybe <laughs> to catch or, or to, to debug. Okay, so for the first time, I'm not writing the code with you, but we are commenting a project that uh, was uh, uh, you know, uh, written by Luigi in the during, during the weekend because the library that we are using we just changed with respect to the last year in a in a very minor ways, but you need to discover them. Um, and they pushed this project uh, uh, yesterday or tonight, depending on your uh, time zone, <laughs> into a, a, a project in week number three, which is called authorization example, out example. Mm -hmm. So we'll follow through the, let's say, the concepts and the theory in the slides, and in parallel, we'll have a look uh, at uh, how this is working in, uh, in this project. Mm -hmm. Basically, let's start from the project itself uh, and try to run it. Uh, again, this project is made uh, in, with the same uh, <coughs> structure that we are now accustomed to. So we have a client uh, uh, directory and we have a server directory. And the server contains the APIs for mm, the, the application itself. Uh, uh, plus some new APIs that we are going to study today for handling the authentication. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the client side, of course, we'll have... Uh, uh, so let's start the server. Okay, and uh, start the client. So this is a, very, a simplified version of the exam scores project uh, where we removed a lot of stuff. Uh, and just to be able to focus on the different uh, um, functions related to the authentication. So basically the idea here is uh, uh, we can provide uh, an email, my email dot uh, here dot com and the password I don't know, whatever, and you try to, so uh, instead of seeing the application in the first place, you see a login page. You see that the home page was redirected to the, some login page. And if the login goes wrong, we get an error, of course, and uh, we cannot proceed. And of course, we are seeing some chatting with the server to validate this login because the only information, the only place where the information about the real users <coughs> are in the server. And if I write the uh, a, a correct uh, um, uh, account, which is student, with the password, which is password. Then the website will know. Yeah, I, I mistyped the password. Uh, and in this case, you can enter into the application and see nothing because just it's just presenting the list you cannot edit anything but because we just uh, removed all the uh, interactive functionalities and uh, uh, okay we have welcome message and then we have logout functionality uh, so what we are doing is uh, uh, understanding how to log into an application how to log out uh, and how to decide that when you are lo not logged in uh, a lot of functionalities will be locked uh, will not be available and the blocking functionalities it will, should happen all, both in the client, so there will, should be some routes that are not accessible. So here we have the home page here. You see the, the, the default route uh, that we can see and it can be generated, it can be rendered because we are logged in. If we logged out, the same route is not accessible. If we try to access it, we will be redirected away to somewhere else or something different will be rendered. So the, the browser, the client application, should know the status of the user, whether you are logged in or not, and behave differently. And at the same time, but we cannot just relay on the, um, on the client. Also, the server should protect itself. So not all APIs should respond unless uh, we have a valid user authenticated. So I cannot see or peek into the scores of another person unless I am authenticated as that person. Hmm? Uh, and, you know, I just cannot, you can say, from the front end, you just uh, don't show the information if you're not logged in. But imagine I'm logged in with maybe one, my user, my username, and uh, 
I just use the console to send different uh, posts or get uh, messages to get information about other users, okay? And uh, the API should not allow that. So remember that the, you cannot, you, we can never trust uh, the client. We can never trust the JavaScript code because it's uh, all in plain sight and every user can play with the console and send different calls. So there should be a layer of protection also on the server. Hmm? Just remember that this is how Facebook started. Okay, <laughs> that uh, where Zuckerberg when he was a, a bad student uh, spent his night in downloading the pictures of our, of her classmates. Uh, by exploiting this bug. So he was logged in with his account, but all the images of other students could be retrieved uh, by just putting the, the ID number in the URL in the request. Okay? So let's not start another disaster like that <laughs> and, uh, um, and see how, how to obtain this very simple uh, uh, result. Okay? Um, okay, just uh, first of all, let's. Uh, make a difference between two related concepts, uh, which, uh, which are also two, related, two similar names, uh, with, uh, which are authentication and authorization. Okay? Authentication means verifying that you are who you say you are. Okay? I'm Fulvio Corno, okay, prove me that you are really him. How? Mm, well, for example, because I show you that I know my password that was registered. Mm? Of course, passwords are one of the ugliest way of authenticating because they have a lot of problems with remembering, with stealing them, and so on. We hope that we are, in the future we'll, have, that we'll find some uh, better solutions, but for now, especially in the web domain, they are still uh, the, uh, the basic way of, of uh, logging in with a website. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, at that point, uh, you can. Uh, be sure that, sure, relatively sure, that in that moment in time, that person is uh, the right person. With this information, what do you do? You authorize that person using that browser on that computer in that moment. You authorize that user to access a set of functionalities that probably will depend on their user profile. So we both log in to the teaching portal at Politecnico. We both uh, uh, go through the same authentication mechanism, but immediately after, depending on where I'm in my profile I'm a teacher or in my profile I'm a student, I will see, I will be able to access completely different functionalities. Okay, so I'm authorized to different functionality. Uh, depending on the user profile, some functionalities are allowed and some are not. Okay? Um, and this can get uh, very complex, if you want, in, in a real big application, because, because you may have different types of users uh, with different uh, uh, privileges or different duties, and you should really be selective about which functions to show uh, to one or another. Hmm? Um, this is, a, is basically unrelated with authentication. Even if they, the two, of course, uh, uh, being able to authorize a user to access some functionality, of course, uh, requires that they first be able to identify or to authenticate the user itself. Um, but uh, it's more of an application issue. Okay, it's how uh, I to say. Not, uh, it's not related with how I protect the website, uh, but basically how I select which routes to show, which functions to allow, and so on. So it's more of, of an application issue rather than a security issue. So we're going basically to focus on the authentication phase, and for us the, authentic the authorization will be much simpler. Okay? If the user is logged in, then uh, allow him to do something. And uh, all these aspects are very, are very tricky because uh, it's, there are the places where uh, you know, malicious users try, the first point where malicious users try to, to trick us and to trick our application to doing something wrong. Okay? Um, and there are really, really a lot of uh, small corner cases and small, a lot of details you know, about in the protocols and in the, uh, in the, in the libraries and so on. Um, and they require a given you know, a collaboration between a client and the server. The type of authentication we are going to develop here 
uh, is suitable from when you are developing API for your own front end. So we are owning the back end with the APIs and the front end at the same time, the REST application. So we are not uh, aiming at publishing a set of API that third party users could call. Okay? Only our application is expected to call them. So we can bind, say, the authentication to the API, well, sorry, the authorization to call the API, we can bind them to the authentication of the user using the front end. This, normally, there are separate concepts, okay? You log in into a website with an account of that website, and your code may call an external API from another API provider. So the, your authentication to, your, to the website that you're using is not the same that you are using to uh, be uh, authorized to call an external API. Uh, usually, we are, there's, there are mechanisms of, of key exchange uh, where you provide a key to the external API provider saying, OK, I'm authorized to call this. Uh, even, if you don't, even if you don't know who I am, I, uh, please respond to me. Or, or something like that, okay? So there are separate uh, um, authorization mechanisms for using the front end and for allowing this front end to call separate APIs. Very stupid example, when you are trying to embed a Google map, for example, in your application. So we have our application, our backend and so on. We are inserting a component that requires an extra API from, from Google. And uh, unless you put the, the right key, you will have a window with a lot of limitations and a lot of warnings saying, OK, uh, you're not authorized to, to access this component uh, because you have, let's say, to pay for it and so on. Mm? And so it's a separate issue. We are not looking into that. We are not looking into providing general purpose APIs that will require generating tokens and using OAuth and other, other mechanisms. But even in our simple case, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the different cases are so many that it's always best uh, to understand, uh, uh, do not invent anything, let's say. Uh, uh, rely on the best practices uh, and uh, if you are really uh, uh, able to, if you really want to publish something in the wild, uh, try a person who, to involve a person who is really an expert in security. Okay, the skills uh, of uh, Application development and the skills of uh, security management are really mm, uh, different, separate. So you cannot be an expert in everything. You cannot just uh, do security by cut and paste. Mm? You really have to have somebody who, un who understands what's happening, will tell you what to do, and you follow blindly uh, what the security experts are telling you. Otherwise, you're getting problems. So, for example, this is a, is a possible breakdown of all the layers in which uh, authentication is involved. But what we see here normally, what we have in mind is that, okay, the user has a login page. Okay, just, that's just the surface. And the login page uh, authorizes the users uh, by checking a password in a database. Okay, that's, that, these are the endpoints. There is some table in the database with the usernames and passwords, or some sort of passwords, and a form for the user to ask to be recognized. How do, does the, this information flow? Okay, uh, we have the user form, and uh, uh, may allow the user, okay, to the basic functionality. This means that the React application, we are going to our context, must know whether the user is logging in or not, so there should be a state variable, or maybe most, most likely a context variable, so it may be accessible for many components, and maybe also some user information. So my name to show in the profile, my profile picture, or some other uh, information related to my own profile. So this information should be v uh, available in the React application if the login is successful, and should be stored there uh, until until logout, basically. Um, this information is stored at the application level, in some states, in some contexts, so inside uh, React components. But uh, uh, as we see, um, we must share this information also with the server. 
it's not enough uh, that the browser knows, uh, okay, I'm, you're logged in. Because this information is not reliable. You can always trick the client uh, by uh, debugging the JavaScript. Uh, you can always uh, trick the client into believing that you are logged in. The problem is that the client should be able to prove to the server that we are really logged in before the server accept, uh, accepts any of our APIs. Okay, so there should be also some information in the server that remembers and knows that we successfully logged in in order to be able to um, decide whether our API calls should be uh, executed or not. And this brings in the concept of navigation session uh, where there are some shared credentials, throw away shared credentials, so the credentials that, that are created at login time and only last for this navigation uh, session, session that are shared between the client and the server. And sharing information between the client and the server requires uh, storing them in the HTTP messages that are exchanged between the two. And this brings uh, the usage of, of cookies. Okay, so uh, to keep the, the, the memory about the authentication, we should introduce a session based on cookies. Hmm? And so we'll see how, how they work. Uh, also being careful about which information we are storing in these cookies because, uh, again, the server can be trusted, but the client cannot be. So it's better to, uh, to hide this information as much as possible for, for, uh, from the client. And then we have the server side that, of course, uh, has some routes uh, that implement all, all our APIs, which is the primary goal of the, of the server. And we must have a mechanism for every API to check the current user who is calling this API and decide whether this user is authorized or not for that specific endpoint. So maybe the get is public or of a given uh, list of maybe courses is public, everybody can retrieve it. Uh, the list of exams is only, uh, say, restricted to one specific user, for example. Mm -hmm. And so every route in the HTTP server should have some check, uh, some protection, um, whether the session is valid and whether the, the, the current user is authorized to call it. And um, Okay, and then of course we have to add some new routes for basically the login and logout operations that uh, uh, will, uh, will be added. So this is all the, the levels, uh, some of the client on the client, some on the server, and some on the protocol that we need to tackle here. So let's start from the basic mechanism that is able to keep uh, um, the authorization uh, alive, which is the sessions. Mm -hmm. Uh, HTTP sessions uh, are uh, a mechanism uh, able to work around uh, the stateless nature of the HTTP protocol. Okay, we already we always known uh, and we also exploited the fact that HTTP is totally stateless. Okay, so you make a request, uh, this request is closed with a response, and after the response is sent. Uh, there is no memory in the server about the, that previous request. So if one millisecond later I'm making the same request, the server will process it as a totally new request without uh, remembering that it just responded to it and without remembering or being aware that I'm the same user that just did that, re that request. So it will treat it as a, any other request coming from any other user in the internet. And this is what makes HTTP so simple and so easy to exploit in different ways. But when we really want you know, to remember something, it gets tricky. Hmm? Um, because if we are thinking just an API call, okay, they are separate. But if, if you are thinking about uh, a navigation session when you log in in a, in a website or you insert some data, and you want this data to be valid after 27 clicks, after you are navigating doing something, you don't want to lose this information. Okay, you want the server to lose this information. Hmm? Um, and so the server, in a way, must remember that the 27 clicks I will, I, click I will do is from the same person that did the first one or logged in maybe five, min five minutes ago. Huh? Uh, so in a way, we should help the server rem um, remember me. 
or recognize me in my uh, in my next clicks. Uh, otherwise, for example, the a very stupid uh, uh, mechanism like the shop, shopping carts or saving information cannot be implemented unless it's implemented completely on the client, uh, because the server will uh, will not know will not be able to remember that. And if we close the browser, everything goes away. So we want the, the server to remember that we already put in the cart three items and, uh, uh, and show me those. Um, okay, so it, this means, this, so uh, HTTP by, by, uh, by itself doesn't do any of this. Uh, it's totally without memory, but we need to recreate the memory in, in some way. Uh, you know, it's like uh, when I'm having a conversation, a conversation with a person and this person gets their memory reset every time they, they say a sentence. Okay, there are a lot of movies about this topic, uh, uh, like uh, Finding Nemo, for example, you know, the, the, the blue fish uh, or forgets something and it's very uh, difficult, uh, difficult to, to have a conversation if every time um, they forget something. And... Uh, um, not in the not in the movie, but a solution uh, would be to have some shared information or some token to be able to remember who I am. Okay, so uh, the first time we interact, I know that you are going to forget about me. So I ask you to give me a code which is called the session ID. Uh, and this code, I, I will store this code. And the next time I interact with you, I will show you the same code. What does it mean? It means that you can recognize the code. You can recognize that you have generated it, so it's valid. And so you can remember me. OK, you cannot remember, really. You can reconstruct who I was because you can look up uh, the code itself. So the server may store locally on the server some specific private information about the interaction with me and uh, you know, put a, a session code, a number on that information. So OK, you, I don't know who you are, but you are the user number 27. And uh, OK, I can store within the user 27 some information about the name, about the, I don't know, the registration information, and so on. And this piece of information, this session data, is created at login time, at the first interaction uh, with the user. And then the next, uh, next time I will call you, I will call an, AT, an, uh, an API. By default, you won't be able to recognize me, but I will show you the number, 27. And so you can, you serve, um, the browser will, will send the number to the server, and the server will look up the number, 27, and will reconstruct all the information. So in a way, we know that our memory is being cleared. So before clearing it, we dump it somewhere safe. And when we need it, we reload it okay, from this uh, safe place. Of course, this works uh, if the number 27 is not easy to guess, because otherwise uh, anybody could uh, hijack a session and pretend to be another user. Uh, so these are not really uh, integral numbers, but are uh, strings uh, of random numbers. Um, okay, so after authentication, the server would generate uh, a new session with a, uh, let's say, random ID. And this ID should be exchanged between the server and the client on every next iteration. Every time they need to speak, they need to uh, exchange information. Because that's the only way for the server to be able to respond uh, knowing who is the caller. Hmm? Uh, the HTTP already provides a mechanism for doing that, for storing this information. You can exchange that in many times, in many ways, uh, but the most natural one is storing them into cookies, which are nothing more than, than headers in the HTTP request and response. Okay? Um, and this means that also our uh, fetch uh, calls and our uh, routes uh, should uh, allow the passing of the cookies between the client and the server. So we should uh, uh, modify a bit uh, 
the way we, in which you are calling the, the, um, the functions. Uh, cookies are not just uh, any header you can add to your HTTP request and response, uh, but uh, they are recognized and managed by, by the browser with some security concerns in mind. Basically, cookie is just a, a, a key value no? uh, attribute. So you can give it a name, you can give it a value, but implicitly, uh, a cookie uh, uh, remembers who generated it. So uh, the browser will automatically store all the cookies that it receives into its internal store, the cache inside the browser, and uh, for every HTTP call you make, whether by navigating with the browser or with a fetch call, so every time the browser will send out an HTTP request, it will append to this request all the cookies that were issued by that specific server where I'm communicating, that I'm communicating with. Okay? And that specific server means the same domain, the same URL, the same path, and the same uh, um, port. Hmm? HTTP port. So, uh, this is an, is an internal mechanism of the browser. The browser will always send you back the same cookies that you gave me, but will promise not to send to any other server the cookie that you gave me. So, cookies are really uh, um, exchanged at every, inter inter um, at every HTTP uh, transaction between one specific server and one specific browser. There, is, there should be no way no, to, to take information from, from a cookie on one server and send this, in, this information to, to another one, okay? Uh, at least inside the HTTP layer. Uh, when we go, if we expose this information to the JavaScript layer, everything can happen, of course. It can get this information and make another fetch to another uh, server by copying this information. So that's why we will try to um, keep uh, the management of the cookie strictly into the browser and not expose this information to the, um, to the JavaScript, okay? To be able to um, keep this level of protection, basic level of protection. Hmm? Um, again, the cookie that is sent to the server comes from a browser. And we can never trust that the browser is not compromised in any way. Maybe the JavaScript code or the browser itself, okay? You take uh, a Firefox, you modify its code, uh, and you use it to navigate and uh, to break, uh, break web websites. So this means that information contained in the cookie cannot be relied upon, cannot be trusted. Information going from the client to the server. The only information that the cookie would, we should bear is the ID. All the associated information should be in the server, not in, inside the cookie that travels back and forth. And this ID should be, you know, cryptographically secure so that the server will be able to say, okay, this is a valid ID, I was issuing it, and it would not be possible from, let's say, uh, some JavaScript hacks uh, uh, to create a valid session ID because maybe it's signed with my own secret signature. Hmm? So the server should have a way of recognizing the validity of the IDs and nothing more. Okay, all the other information about the session should be stored in the server side associated with that ID. The browser doesn't need to know the ID, we just need to replay it back, to send it back. Hmm? So, it's a, a game of hiding, okay? I, I have some information from you, but I don't trust you to know it, I don't trust you to, uh, to save it, so I, I'm giving you the key for opening the box in which I will store the information. Hmm? Um, so basically, we, we are going to work with some cookies that have one, for example, name, which is session ID, and have one value hmm, that is contained uh, in, in the cookie that is meaningless for the client. It is important that for the client it's meaningless, but for the server it uh, can be validated and can unlock the information stored in the server. Then when we create a cookie, we can set uh, uh, some uh, options, there are many of them, 
one uh, option is uh, uh, whether the cookie is uh, secure means that it's only issued, uh, it's only valid uh, over HTTPS connections. We are not doing HTTPS, so for us it would be false, uh, even if in production uh, it would be normal, normally uh, true, mm, because in production the website will be published on HTTPS, but we don't want to handle also certificates for that. Uh, one inter inter very interesting uh, option is called HTTP only. That means that the cookie is, of course, managed by the browser, but it will not be shown exposed to uh, the JavaScript code. So the JavaScript code will not be able to see or to retrieve information about this cookie. And this is useful for us because we don't have any risk of, okay, of mangling or or, or, or uh, exposing, uh, let's say, secure information. So we are, all, we are going to generate HTTP-only cookies that will be invisible to, the, to, the, to, the, to our code. Okay? It's the browser that will handle them. And uh, uh, one possibility is also to set uh, an expiration date on a cookie that uh, tells the browser not to use uh, that cookie after the, the time so it's normal, for example, to create a new session with an expiration time of 20 minutes. I see this number a lot. And if after 20 minutes or of inactivity, the session expires. <coughs> and you see them in, in, uh, in, in many websites, okay? You need to log in after 20 minutes of, of inactivity. And then maybe the website as, as a way to let you recover this old information. Um, but then will be at, at the application level. Um, and also, will, it will allow the server to refuse any cookie that was generated before this, uh, after, this uh, after this expiration date. Mm? So it will limit, uh, even if you get stolen a cookie, it will limit uh, the validity of that uh, ID to a, uh, to a limited time. Mm? Uh, otherwise, you can, uh, you can, if you, you can create uh, permanent cookies that will keep you logged in forever, okay? But uh, it's not uh, a very good idea. Uh, but for us, I think the HTTP only uh, it will be a, a mandatory attribute to set when we generate the cookie, so in the server. So what we're doing here is uh, uh, at, at login time, so this is happening at login time, the browser is sending some credentials to the server. So, for example, the user entered the username and password. These are being sent with a normal POST request. A POST because we are trying to create uh, a session. So, POST is good for creating new objects. Um, these are, in this case, they are sent in clear. In reality, I would send them over an HTTPS connection, so that at, least, at least they are not readable. But the password itself uh, is... Uh, a string. Hmm? Uh, the server would uh, validate this password and the username and whether they are correct, uh, it will create uh, a session object. So creating a new session ID and associating with this session ID some information, I like, don't you know, username, the user profile, other data and so on. So we have a session storage here which acts as a, as a map. A map unlocked by session IDs, and for each session ID, we associate some set of information. This ID is generated by the server, and is encapsulated into a cookie and sent back uh, with the response. So the browser only receives the session ID. The server also stores some information about the current user in the session storage, linked or accessible by the session ID. Um, how does that server know this information? But well, usually by querying the database. Okay, we query the database, we check the password, and we retrieve information about the user and store it into the session. That's it for the login. And in, in the next uh, iteration, when we are calling an API, the browser will automatically append this cookie because we are calling an HTTP request on the same server, on the same port, where it was generated. 
so will be sent automatically so we in our code don't see this because it's HTTP only we are no way and don't need to generate this it's all handled by the HTTP layer in the browser so the server will receive a session ID we'll check in the session storage if the session ID is valid if it's there if it's not expired and so on and if so it can retrieve this data and use them in the API in the in the server code for example to retrieve the username and uh, use it for querying the list of exams or the list of all the specific information for that user hmm? so in this case you see that get exams uh, doesn't provide the name of the user because the name of the user is already known to the server because the server remembers the previous login and it's better in this way than providing the name of the user here because the name of the user here can be faked can be manipulated but this information here stored there in the server cannot be manipulated in any way okay if we are sure that the decision id cannot be replicated otherwise if some checks failed maybe i not a uh, decision id is not valid i'm not authenticated or i'm not authorized to, to do these get exams because i have a you know, a profile like a visiting students and so I don't have some list of exams to see or whatever, then I can, of course, uh, um, generate an error instead of, of uh, responding to this, uh, to this API. Okay, so we are two very separate moments. What to do at login and what to do at every API call. They both rely on this server information. Um, Okay, these slides uh, is only meant to be scary about uh, for you. So saying that uh, even if we don't understand all the details here, the hackers will do. And there's a lot of a longer, let's say, a wide literature of type of attacks that exploit uh, uh, not, vul not vulnerabilities in the browser, in the server, but especially in in the application code. Okay, so uh, let's try not to handle. No, this, info, this uh, operation ourselves, uh, but try to rely on some libraries that already implement, uh, let's say, the best practices uh, about security. So, talking about the, the libraries, the next step will be, okay, how do we implement all of this in practice? How we generate session IDs, how to make it them secure, how do we validate them, how do we validate calls and so on. So, in practice, uh, we are going to use uh, a library which is called Passport that uh, is one of the most uh, let's say popular uh, libraries for this purpose in the Express ecosystem. Okay, all the authorization, 90% of the authorization uh, is in the server because it's the only uh, trusted place we can, where we can check all this information. So we need some library, some framework uh, to, be, to implement in the server. And then, of course, we we'll need to plug the, the, the calls in, in, the, in the front end, in the, in the, in the, in the React application, but uh, all the difficult parts will be in the server. To uh, be able to handle all this flow, so this flow 1, 2, 3, 4 corresponds to the steps in the previous picture. So the user fills uh, uh, the form that is validated in the browser, in the application, and if, if data is valid, so uh, the password is not empty and the email is in the valid format and so on, so normal form validation, we are sending it with a post API. So we, are, we will have an API for sending the login data that will be checked by the server. And the server will uh, uh, create the session or send an error message back to the client. If everything goes right, we have a session ID that will be managed by the server. And uh, from this moment on, the server will reply uh, with, a, with a cookie every time. This time and all the next time, so the cookie will be regenerated by the server, and this cookie will be stored by the browser. Hmm? So we start uh, the first, the, real, the, fir um, the really first step uh, is uh, allowing the user to enter some credentials. And this is just a form. Okay, nothing special. 
a form with a, a username and password state variable, so like no, every, every normal controlled forms. It's all React until we call some API uh, in, the, in the submission phase. So everything starts when we call this uh, user login callback in our code that will be part of our APIs uh, for starting the login process. It's just a component that uh, at submission time will call some callback for starting the login process with a pair of variables, a username and a password. This, right uh, up to now, they are just local state, just used for controlling the input elements. We still don't have any global state, no context, uh, uh, because the user is not logged in yet. This is just local information, what we type in, in the input. And then we need to process this information. As, a, as I said, uh, we are going to use the passport uh, library. Passport is a, is, a, is a middleware for Express, so it will be able to, to add some hooks during the processing of the requests. And uh, the uh, good point of Passport is that it's so-called, they, they call themselves uh, modular. Uh, it means that they give you more or less the same mechanism for handling uh, the login, logout, and authorization process in different ways, using different techniques, uh, what they call strategies. If you go to the strategies, you have 538 different strategies, different ways of authenticating the user, let alone aut authorizing it, just for authentication. So, uh, for example, what we are going to use is the strategy called local, it means I will check the password on a, on a local database. But you can have a Google authorization, you can have a login with, with um, Facebook, uh, login with a Twitter account, uh, with uh, open, open out, with open, open ID, and uh, you name it, with GitLab, with uh, GitHub. So when uh, you have a website that will accept you, um, will allow you to log in with different information providers, actually their backend uh, will integrate different uh, techniques, and in Passport they are called different strategies. Mm. So all the tricks, all the key exchange, uh, and so on, uh, um, that are needed to integrate with these uh, authentication providers, because they are basically authentication providers, are managed by these different libraries. So we have this, the Passport library, and then each of these uh, strategies, uh, so the Passport, the Passport library is a module, and each of these strategy, you see, is a different, uh, separate, and additional module to install. So we have to install the passport library and uh, uh, the strategy that we want to use. Hmm? Uh, this uh, means that here in this course we are going the, the simple way, the simplest one, which is the local strategy, but it will be easy you know, uh, for you to maybe move to other type of authentication because we are in the same framework. We just change the strategy, of course, you need to study how to initialize uh, and what parameters to provide uh, to, to allow other strategies. No? These are <coughs> a, bit more, mm, a bit more complex. So the, the, the advantage of Passport is that it's very complete uh, because it gives you the, the tools for uh, integrating with different types of uh, uh, authorization providers. The bad part of Passport is that it's probably the worst documentation that they've seen. No? It's the library which is really not documented or badly documented. And so in many, many times it's difficult to understand what to do. You just you have to rely on examples found here and there and try to reverse engineering. So when you are when you do want, when you don't want to document your code, uh, I suggest you to spend maybe one hour uh, looking at the passport documentation and then you will understand the importance of uh, proper documentation. Okay? Uh, I remember last year there was a reference with, uh, which was very minimal with a list of functions, a list of methods, uh, and they decided to delete it because they replaced the reference with a, with a tutorial. 
this is just a step by step without explaining any concepts. So, uh, if you seek some information about passport and from the official website uh, and you feel frustrated, uh, it's normal. Okay, uh, it's not normal in general, but uh, it's the uh, so in this documentation the reference is actually doesn't exist here. This is just one specific aspect of the object user, but all the list of APIs, uh, yeah, they, 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 they forgot to probably to, to put them here. I don't know what. Hmm? Uh, so uh, probably we, we, in these slides, we try to put together information from different sources to make it to make it work. Hmm? Um, OK. So for example, all but uh, once you have it uh, once you uh, get it running, uh, it will do a lot of stuff for you. For example, all the handling of the cookie is automatically handled by the library. You don't need to do anything. Uh, we just need to understand, but all the operations, creating the cookie and storing it and so on, it's also automatic. So what are the steps for using uh, Passport? Passport, I remember, uh, um, is uh, a middleware for Express. So imagine we have a normal Express project. We need to add this middleware to, uh, to our um, Express application. First of all, we need to decide which strategy to adopt. Okay, I'm um, from the list of 500 and more strategies, we select one. For example, the local strategy. And at that point, uh, we install this middleware, we install the strategy by the required statements uh, in, uh, in Express inside our Express application, and we, you normally need to, to um, configure, to personalize uh, that strategy. Maybe they need some parameters, uh, they need some uh, uh, keys, uh, they need some uh, uh, addresses for the website, and so on. Okay? Depends on the strategy. Uh, in the case of a local strategy, I'm going to the server to see the first steps. Okay, uh, we are importing these two lines here. We are importing the passport library and we decided to import the password local strategy. Okay, and the local strategy doesn't need uh, a lot of uh, uh, configuration. Where is that? Uh, here. And uh, the configuration of the strategy is in this call. This we are we are going to see that. Basically, you are registering password.use new local strategy. So what we are doing here is uh, to uh, install a strategy into the password library. And later on, we will uh, install the password library in the API calls, so here, later on. We'll see the different steps. So what we are doing is to create a passport object, to plug in into this passport object a strategy object, and then all of this will be a middleware that we can install in our application, app.use. So app.use will register the middleware into Express, while the passport.use here the name is always used, but the object is different. Uh, we just set and configure a strategy inside uh, the passport. Of course, uh, the type of parameters that you need uh, to create the strategy depend on the type of strategy. So we see one. And then, so uh, setting up the strategy, register then, and then giving passport the information about what is a user for you. What is the information that you want to associate with the user? Okay, the username will be, or user ID will be always there. The, uh, for example, the passport is part of a local strategy, but it's not part of other strategies. If you log in with Google, the passport will not be shown here, so there, but there will be a token. So there's some information about the user that is implicit in the type of strategy we select. There's other information that depends on our case. So, for example, we, have, um, we may have uh, um, 
a field that will tell whether I'm a student or not, whether I'm enrolled or graduated or whatever. So there's some extra information that we want to remember about the user. So we must give information of, to Passport to how to retrieve this information from the database and what to store in the session so that it can be retrieved. Hmm? Okay, one, two, three, the different steps. Creating a local strategy. So we are focusing from this moment only on local strategy. Uh, creating a new local strategy means providing a callback Okay, we are giving to Passport a function. The local strategy is configured by providing a, passport, a function. This function we call it verify. This function will be called by Passport whenever it needs to check whether user is valid or not. We are not calling this function. It's a callback that will be, managed, will be called in the right moment. And this function that we must write, okay, this callback, we must provide this callback uh, that received three parameters, username, passport, uh, and the third parameter, which is a callback. Uh, sometimes it's called, uh, in the documentation, it's called callback, uh, sometimes it's called CB for callback, sometimes it's called done, in, uh, it's not a very consistent, but it's a callback. So what, what should we do? We must pre, uh, implement one verify function that will take a username and a passport and a password. We'll check them according to our database. So passport doesn't know, doesn't care about the database. It just asks me, can you please verify this pair username and passport, password? And I will verify them inside the body of this function. And then a later call, a callback, to tell Passport whether the verification went well or created some problems, or there were any problems. Okay, so the sequence is the user will try to log in, Passport will call the verify function, this is my function, I will do the checks, and after the checks I will call the callback to tell Passport whether to allow this call or not, whether these credentials were right or not. Okay? So callback, this callback here is a function in Passport that I must call. Mm -hmm. Verify is a password in my code that Passport will, will call. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what I'm doing inside Verify is uh, checking with the database. I check whether in the database we have a a user table with a given username and with a given password. Password. Hmm? And uh, depending on how this check goes, whether the user is present or not, whether the password is correct or not, we are calling the callback in different ways. This callback is the key <clears throat> for telling Passport how it went, how the authentication went. Uh, what we do to, with the username and passport, uh, password is our business, but the important thing is how to call this callback function. And we can call it in four different ways, basically. As it's uh, normal in um, uh, Node.js callbacks, uh, the first parameter is an error, and the second parameter is a value hmm? in the callback. Uh, we are used to uh, SQLite works in this way. So if everything is okay, the first parameter will be null. If the first parameter is not null, it's an error message or an error object of any time, of any kind. So will Passport will assume that if the callback contains an error and an object uh, or some, anything that is not null in the first parameter, then there were problems. Otherwise, uh, there, if there were no errors, uh, uh, error means that they were or wasn't able to validate. Maybe the database connection was broke or something else. Otherwise, uh, uh, the first parameter is null, so the validation went through and may have been successful or not. 
Okay? I was able to validate the user, and the answer is yes, the user is valid, or no, the user is not valid. In the first case, no error, the user is valid. I provide you with a user object. So I'm calling the second parameter of the callback with an object user that contains my information. Okay? Passport will store the information and will make it available to the APIs, to the routes in Express, so that they can extract this information and use it for, to, to generate the response. Uh, so it will be stored. Hmm? Uh, Passport doesn't care the uh, about the structure of this object. This is my information that is retrieved from the database. I decide what I need. Hmm? Or uh, if the Validation was successful, but the user, but the password was wrong. So there were no errors in the in the code, but the user didn't exist, or the user did exist, but the password was wrong, was not the correct one. I can send false as a second parameter. Okay, and maybe if I want, I can add a third parameter with an explanation, but just an explanation. It doesn't change. So. Um, the first, uh, message, the first parameter contains something if there were some, some, some exceptions, some errors during the execution of the validation. If the validation works well, it may provide the user or provide the information that these credentials are not valid with a false second parameter. Mm -hmm. So we have these three, three, four different ways. Uh, the, the difference with the between the second and the third is just uh, whether we provide the message or not. So we must implement <clears throat> uh, and this strategy, this uh, callback, uh, that is called automatically. And you can guess, uh, what, where do these username and password fields come from? How can a passport, which is just a middleware, know <laughs> where, this, where to extract this information from? Uh, actually, it doesn't know, so there's no way to tell it, uh, but it will assume that the username and the password are in the body of the request. So username will be extracted from request.body.username and password will be extracted from request.body.password. Password. And we remember that request.body is populated uh, from the JSON middleware if we have a JSON request, okay? So this will be already be done by Express. And uh, Passport already assumes that when you are checking the validity, the body will contain these two parameters with, with these two names. So please don't call it user, user ID or anything else, because otherwise Passport will not find it and will call uh, the, uh, the, the verify function with a null or undefined parameter. OK? So this. Uh, a sort of behavior which is not configurable. This strategy expects uh, this information to be encoded in this way, which of course has an impact on the API structure. This is not very nice because the internal behavior of a library uh, influences the type of API that I'm exposing. The post method will have to contain these fields with these names. Hmm? Okay, but we have to live with it. So this is the function that will be called in the right uh, place. We'll see uh, how to call it, how to tell uh, to Passport which is the method for, for logging. But first, uh, we must have a look at the password itself. Um, it's uh, inevitable that this password is a clear string. It's not inevitable, but in the, lo in the normal case, in the you know, login and password case, uh, the password goes from the browser, from a text field in the browser, to the server. So this is a string that contains actually the, the characters typed by the user. But we will never want uh, to store these plain text passwords in the database. Okay? Because uh, if we can, we can try to protect this information in transit by using an HTTPS connection. But we don't want this information to be stored in place anywhere. Okay? Uh, we, we, we must use it uh, 
to validate the user and then forget and delete this information immediately. So the server will never store plain text passwords. So even if somebody will steal your database, they will not be able to reconstruct the same password. Okay? This is a basic security requirement. Nobody can retrieve your password, not even the site administrator, not even the hacker or, 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 or what. So we don't store the password, but we store a, a hash code corresponding, generated starting from the password, a password and from a random um, salt that is changed every time. So what the user table looks like, actually, is something like this. Okay, it's something where we have the email of the user and the password field is not the real password, it's a hash created by encrypting the password with a given salt. Huh? The, the salt is uh, a number, which is uh, any random, is a random number that is used to uh, avoid that two users with the same password, password would have the same uh, encryption. So if I write, if I use a password, one, two, three, four, and you are using the password one, two, three, four, if we encrypt the string one, two, three, four, we will get the same result. And so if I get, if I put my hands into the, onto the database, I can, maybe I don't know which is the password, but I know that the two of, you, of us have the same password. So we wanted to have a mechanism for encrypting or hashing, it's not a real encryption because we can, it's not reversible. We don't need to go back to the original password, password never. But to hash uh, the same password, giving different results by putting some random number into the, uh, into the, the signing process. Okay, so we'll see the code for doing that. So actually we have a salt which is just a random number and uh, the password hash depends on the password value and on the salt. And we can check the password hash only by knowing, by trying to recompute it if we know the password that comes from the user and the salt that comes from the database when we verify that. Um, so, how to create these uh, encrypted values and how to validate them? We must rely on some, uh, let's say, crypto libraries inside Node that will allow us uh, to, to generate and to check uh, these hashes. We have a link here to a website where we can try them uh, interactively, okay? So if we have some like uh, one, two, three, four, uh, I, we, can, uh, we can try to encrypt it and, and get a hash for that. Hmm? But of course we need to do that in, in our code. So in uh, uh, Node.js, we have a module called Crypto that contains a couple of, of methods uh, for create, hashing a password and, and comparing them. Hashing a password takes one password in clear, one salt, which is a random number that you can, we can create, uh, for example, again, with, uh, from the Crypto library with a random number generator. So we create a, a random salt. We take the user password. We decide the length of the key, maybe 32 bytes or 64 bytes, and we call the S script. A script will run the encryption and will uh, it doesn't return a value, that will be too easy. It will call a function that will provide in the second parameter the hash password if the error is null. Okay? So in this way we can translate a clear text password into a hash. When we are generating the hash for the first time, of course the salt will be random. When we recreate the same hash from 
um, an existing password to check them, to compare them, of course, the, the salt should be extracted from the database because we want to rehash it with the same salt, of course. And for checking uh, whether a password matches, we have this uh, equality method that will check whether a stored password, stored password is uh, this value, is equal with the hash password that is just computed by the script function, a script function. Okay, so this means that during validation, remember that we had in our code, uh, we, we had uh, in our verify function, let's go back to the code. In the verify function of the local strategy, we called uh, a get user In the, in, in the verify method, okay? With the username and password. Get user goes into the DAO, into the database code, and uh, if we go to the implementation, it does all of this. It needs to do all of this. So the easy part, we are receiving a, a request for validating a user, we have the email and the password in clear. We cannot immediately check it with the one query because for checking the password, we need the salt. So we make a first query to extract the user with the given ID, user ID. Okay, we read the, the line in the user table with the ID. We get all the fields, of course, uh, if there are some errors and so on. If row is undefined, resolve false means that the user ID doesn't exist. There is no user with this username. And so we say false. And false means that uh, uh, we return null false. No error really, but the session is not valid. In this case, because the username is missing. If the username is present, we go forward and, uh, okay, we, we are building a user object uh, with the information coming from the database, the ID, the email, a name. You see that in the, in the user object, we are not putting the, pass, the password nor the salt. This information should not go around, okay? We don't need it, we just need it during verification, we don't need it to store it for later. So it's not the full table, it's only the uh, useful information. But right now we know that we have a user, we don't know whether the password is correct yet. And for doing that, uh, we must create uh, a new hash password by calling the script function. And uh, we, we, can, we may call it from by passing the salt row.salt. It's a salt that we just read from the database. Okay, we are, remember, we are inside the SQLite callback here. We did the first query. We have in the row the result of the first query that contains these four fields. Um, okay, so inside this, uh, we call the S script uh, to compare the, uh, to compute the hash of the clear password that we just received from the user with this given salt that we just retrieved from the database. This will compute a hash password that will be given to this callback, this function called callback. And again, this function have as two parameters, an error and the, and the hash itself. So if there is an error, it means that for some reason it couldn't compute the hash, the, the, the hash. so maybe the salt was not in the proper length or, or uh, the password was null or whatever. If uh, it could compute the hash password, then we can use the comparison function to compare the password extracted from the database, and here are just some 
conversion from a binary to a text uh, format with the hash password that we just computed, because these passwords are uh, a binary strings. And in, database, in the database, just for readability, we are not storing binary values by the hex encoding of the password themselves. So we must convert the hex to a binary, the hex string into a binary sequence of, of, of data. Hmm? This is an example of all the details that need to be set right uh, before everything works. That's why. So we are comparing the binary version of the password in database, the, of the hash password in the database, with the hash that we just recomputed with fresh information with the password coming from the user. If they are equal, OK, we can resolve this problem by, by saying, this is a, here we have this information, and this user information uh, will be returned. CB is the callback that we mentioned before. Null user means uh, validation was OK, and here is the user. If the comparison doesn't work right, we result to false. We don't need to reject, we don't need to generate an exception. It's normal, everything went right, but the password was wrong, was not the correct one. And resolving to false causes the same error as before. So we get here in two cases, when the user is not present, or where the user is present, but the password is wrong. And it's a good practice not to tell the user which was the case. No. We don't want any attacker to first guess the username and then when he knows that the username is valid, then guess the password. I get a message that say one or the other or both are wrong. Okay? So this is the com say complication that we get. Uh, if we didn't uh, have encryption, we would uh, just have one extra instruction here, and password equal to the password. But we, we don't want, we cannot no, rely on, on that, and so this make it, make be, you know, it's a bit more complicated and we need uh, this extra step here. Okay? So this was for, no, if we were here, we were uh, discussing about validation of the user, and we had to make a detour into uh, storing a um, cryptographic version of the password. So this is the same code uh, just uh, shown in, in the slide. Um, OK, so right now we are at a point where the user has been validated when we have the user information. Remember that this information will be forgotten immediately after we send the response, because Express will forget any local variable when we close the request. So we must, uh, before sending the response, we must uh, um, store the information in the session. Create a session, create a session cookie, and store the user information inside that session. Otherwise, <laughs> we can say, OK, the password was valid, and I immediately forget about you, so the next step I will give you an error because I don't remember that I just validated you. Hmm? And uh, managing the session is not a job for Passport, it's a job for Express. So there's an, another middleware in Express for handling session cookies, for handling uh, the session store that will associate to, for generating session ID and uh, managing the session store that will associate with every session ID some spe uh, specific session data. The name of the middleware, you can guess it, is Express Session. Okay. That, uh, again, should be installed and should be uh, let's say configured as a middleware in our application. 
and then we have uh, another call here to install a, and so we are installing here two middlewares one for generating session cookies and we'll see the parameters in a moment and the other where passport will uh, um, exploit the information stored in the session for storing and for recreating user information so there are two steps one generating the session and second allowing passport to store in the session information about the user the user object that we just created remember we call the callback with null user that user is now in the hands of passport and passport must have a way for taking that object and storing it into the session storing it somewhere we decide it to be the session a session cookie Session storage, not the cookie itself, but the storage associated with that cookie. And so that's why this, this additional middleware is the handling of the information inside the session by passport. And we'll see how it works. So there are two separate steps. Uh, the first step is uh, configuring the session itself. This is just the session middleware. Uh, has nothing to do with password in general and uh, we said at the beginning that uh, session IDs should be recognizable so the server should be able to recognize whether session ID was generated by him or not by it or not so 27 is not a good session ID we want session IDs to be signed by the server so that the server can check the signature later on and say okay this is one of mine I generated it and uh, the session mechanism in Express is quite basic because it requires you, when you create a session object, uh, to define a secret phrase, a secret string, a string that will be used to sign the uh, session IDs. So a session ID will be a, a string of numbers that will contain internally um, a number one, two, three, four of, of the session, but it's encrypted, uh, sorry, it's signed with this uh, secret here. This secret is in the server, and anybody who knows this secret will be able to hijack your sessions because it will be able to generate uh, a session ID which you will recognize as your own. So it should be really a secret. Hmm? Uh, we should not commit this string uh, into github in general okay not for this project but normally if we have some code like this where in a given point we have a, a private key basically and you commit it to a repository you are you are sure that two seconds later these there are bots that are collecting <laughs> this information and are publishing them outside so it's already so either you uh, use a, a secret value just for development and then you're sure that in, uh, the, um, in production you are changing it and uh, the key in production, the secret in production will never be stored in any, uh, in any uh, GitHub repository. Or uh, something that, we can, that a lot of people do is uh, to store the secret in the environment at the operating system level. So before starting the server before starting Nodemon, we set some variable set secret equal to in the shell okay and then let uh, node query the environment uh, so we we are moving the knowledge of the uh, of the sec secrets from the web application so outside of the web application into the scripts uh, that we use to, to start it into the operating system Okay? That will be outside of the project. No place is safe, of course, but uh, we'll try not to make it too explicit. But uh, what, what happens here is that uh, I remember uh, in, the, in the past exams uh, you know, that I was revising one project after the other, okay, when I had all the submissions. And it happens more than once uh, that when I close one project and, oh, and run another one, I open the application and I'm already logged in. So what happens is that uh, the two students submitted 
the project with the same secret that was already in the code in the initial project, no? in the, the cap copied from the project that we, that we, for the example that we did. And so if two different servers have the same uh, secret, the sessions generated by one of them are valid also in the other one. Okay, it's, uh, so at least change it to something different. Hmm? It's not a very strong security, okay? But at least, uh, uh, so the first one is a required secret. And second parameter could be where to store the session data. Remember we mentally we visualize the session information as a map, mapping session ID with some data object. Where are these data objects stored? Uh, okay. Again, there are a lot, many solutions. Uh, if we don't specify any store, uh, by default, the express session will store all this information in memory. So it will not be persisted anywhere. Uh, it's good if we don't have many concurrent sessions in our server, because otherwise uh, the memory requirement for node will grow in proportion to the currently active sessions, not all the sessions, but only the, the ones that are currently active. Um, if we don't want to do this, uh, which is it's, it's very useful because there's no configuration needed. Otherwise, you can configure different stores, for example, database. So you give uh, Express session a database, where, a database table where to store its information about the sessions. And of course, you give a method for storing for retrieving data. Okay? Uh, so it's a, more, it's a more robust setting. You probably want to store the information into a, next, into a SQL database, or in many cases, they are using some Redis stores. You know, Redis is a key value uh, database, uh, which is a separate process that you can store the data and retrieve it from that. It's much faster than a SQL database. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not persistent, because normally we don't want that to be persistent. Uh, there's also the, the question whether we want the same session to be shared by different servers. So imagine you have a very high load uh, server, so you replicate, you have se several API servers to distribute the load, and the session generated by one of them should be recognized by a different one. And so not just recognizing the ID, but also sharing the same data. And so you need to have a storage for sessions which is shared between different uh, HTTP servers. So it, it becomes complex, of course. The simplest one, if we don't specify any store, it will remember this data in memory. This means that we, if we restart the application, the server, of course, the session will be destroyed, but it's not, it's not a big problem. Then we have a couple of other options uh, that are resave and save and initialized uh, that, let's say, we don't care too much about them except that their default, their default value is not good. <laughs> so we need to specify them to change the default. This is a historical uh, a pro problem from the first versions. Uh, resave meant uh, that the session data is saved to the store at every HTTP response uh, instead of being saved only when, when it changed. Uh, the default was to save it always, even if it didn't change, but it doesn't make any sense. So we set it to false so that it will save the session to the store only if it was modified. Otherwise, we are just wasting, wasting time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is also another uh, you know, detail about uh, uh, storing cookies be before the session was authenticated, but let's say by by default, we are setting both to false, which is the opposite of the default value. Really, what is important is the secret, and we don't specify any store, so it goes into memory. It's not recommended in production, but it's good for development. So at this point, the sessions are configured, and we need to tell Passport to use them. Okay, let's see also uh, this, this more step and then we, we have a break. Uh, so let's also have a look at the code. Where, where, is all, where did 
where do we do all of this? Session, okay, is we import a session middleware and we, where is that? Yeah. We uh, configure and install the session middleware here. So we create a session object with these parameters and install that into Express. Okay. Next step is uh, to uh, tell the pass uh, passport to use this session. We saw the instruction here. Use passport.session. Sorry, it's not uh, the same code. Uh, use passport.session tells passport to store information in the session. So it, me it needs uh, a method for uh, when a new information is created, when the user is validated, to store this information into the session, and another method for retrieving the same information. And uh, these methods are called serialized user and deserialized users, user. These are configuration methods. They, you call them once by, by providing a function, a callback, and this callback will be called every any time passports need to save a user. Remember, we are in an HTTP server, so before, just before sending the response, we must save information, otherwise it will be reset in our memory. And when we receive the request, a new request, we must refresh our information from the storage, okay? And these are the two, say, callbacks that are called just before shutting down, for saving, shutting down a single request for saving information, and the other is for retrieving the information itself. So we call serialized user with a callback for saving, and deserialized user with a callback for retrieving. Uh, serialized user will get, uh, um, will be called with the user information, with the user object, and this user object, you remember it, is coming from the validate function. So when we return an, a user object from the validate function, that object will be passed to serialize here. And we can create, we can, CB is the callback. We call the callback with the information about what, with the set of information that we want to store in the session. What do we want to remember? In this case, just to be more explicit, I just repeated the same fields, but. It could be the user object itself. So an object that comes from the validate function, to the folder, sorry, from the verify function, and is stored in the, session, in the session. We can store the same object or something different, but this is what will be remembered. So we have no, we don't need to do anything about this value here. It will be already you know, transported by, by passport from the verify function to the serialized function, to this callback. Uh, internally, there is a value called uh, passport, as an attribute of the session called passport uh, that is used to store this information. But uh, the suggestion is that we don't use this object, we actually use the serialize and deserialize methods. Deserialize uh, does the reverse, queries the uh, session, extract the information, and makes this information available as an attribute to the request. So remember, we are in a middleware implementation, so this middleware can modify the request and response objects before giving them to me. So this means that whenever we are calling an API, first passport will call, will uh, analyze whether the session is valid. If the session is valid, we'll call deserialized user And uh, uh, we must call this uh, callback uh, with information about the user that is extracted from the session. This user information here that we receive in the callback is uh, from the session. It's the same object that we store in the session. The parameter of the callback will be copied in the request. 
Okay? So, an HTTP request comes with a session ID. Passport will take the session ID and check which data, which user data was stored associated with that session ID. Okay, I have some session data. Now I call the deserialized user method, callback set with the deserialized user, with this user data. And uh, I expect the user to call callback by giving me what information to store in the request. So this means that as a programmer, in our API, we don't need uh, to check or to look or to manage the session. We know that we have uh, the user information in the request object itself. So the session needs to be configured properly. But when it's configured, saving something to the session after a successful, a successful verify, or retrieving something from the session at every call, is done, is done automatically, transparently. So what we see uh, when we program the application, we see that we have this field request.user, and it's called user, there's no way to call it in a different way, uh, already populated with information about the current user that was validated lo at login time. We know that it's hidden in the, in the session because we configured all of that. So there's a lot of configuration to be done and to be done correctly. But after that, writing the code is very easy. Huh? When, we see, when we go to the uh, really <laughs> writing the API code, we'll see that uh, everything will, will fit into place and will be very fast uh, because uh, Passport will call the right callbacks and we exchange the right data at the right time. Hmm? It's just a bit painful to get there. Okay, so before trying a real login, I think we can try a, a break for this uh, mind-bending stuff, okay? So see you after a good coffee.